I'm going to give a little overview of how uh, we're using movement, a sort of conceptual framework. And then we're each going to introduce uh, some of the projects that we're implementing these approaches on uh, to show you sort of tangible things in, in uh, of, of applying movement to conservation issues. And then we're going to have a discussion which we'd like to open uh, to, the, to the group. Hopefully there's many of you using movement uh, in this broader audience. And so we'd really enjoy uh, exchanging information, ideas, and approaches that are being used. Because um, sometimes I think we get a bit siloed in our particular context and our particular issues. Um, so uh, thank you for that introduction for us. So we're all good. Um, I just wanted to start with sort of a, a broad overview of, of application of movement to conservation. Um, and, and so if, if uh, just to give you a little heads up, a little a focus of how we're going to organize or how we might organize how we use movement data. So the movement data comes into Earth Ranger. Uh, we use it for real-time aspects, which we'll talk about. But a lot of the application of movement data is post-collection. Uh, the movement data can be really powerful at a real-time context. It also becomes very powerful when you have movement data over a longer time period. So you can understand how they're using space over a long time period. Um, so one of the things that we've been working on is, the, is called the landscape of movement. So understanding how different movement behaviors occur in different areas of the landscape. And so we found a lot of uh, power. I'll, I'll show a couple examples um, of that uh, shortly. But that's an aggregate summary of movement, say, over a season, over a year, over a decade. Um, these things can be very powerful to understand what areas in the landscape the animal needs and how it's using those different areas. Okay, so sort of an aggregate, not real-time place. Um, oops, sorry. Then we also do individual behavioral work with movement. And this can be done in real-time applications. So in Earth Ranger, we have several uh, different uh, analytical uh, approaches. Actually, there's four currently coded in Earth Ranger that can give you insights into directly real-time aspects of the animal's movement and behavior and help you answer questions with that. Um, we can also look at uh, the behavioral uh, identification over longer, term frame, uh, longer time frames to be able to help identify some of the behavior going on with the elephant in different spaces. And I'll show a few examples of that just now. Um, third, commonly, when we're managing systems or we're working in an ecosystem, it's really important to understand the key drivers of the system or the key factors structuring that ecosystem. Uh, and animal movement can be a really powerful way to do that. A lot of what we do is survey. We would, we would love to have uh, real-time demographic information to understand you know, when animals are feeling good enough to reproduce when animals are dying. Um, but that, that information can be quite difficult to collect at a landscape scale. Movement is possible to collect at a landscape scale. And we can identify seasonal transitions. Uh, you can look at different parts of your system where animals might be resident, other places where they're highly mobile or migratory. And that can tell you a lot about the ecological availability, the sort of quality of that system for those animals. What, they're, what pressures they're facing. So movement can give you insights to the general ecological processes in the landscape. Um, finally, I wanted to highlight on-animal sensors. And this is something we use quite a bit uh, to, I, to either uh, survey. Actually, people have just started using a study came out last week where they put a video on tiger sharks to measure seagrass in the Caribbean Ocean. And they actually were able to quantify the area of seagrass based on video. On, so the animal is actually the survey uh, tool in that case. You put a sensor on it, it does the survey. So there's approaches coming on board where the animal can do some survey. So I just want to quickly show a few examples. Landscape of movement. Um, hot spots are really important in landscape. This is what it looks like when you collect a bunch of data. Uh, you look at it. Maybe it's difficult to, for the patterns to emerge. Um, we can connect the dots. It still may be difficult to see patterns on this landscape. But we can do analytics that give us hot spots. Uh, in this case, red is, is hot, is heavily used. Uh, the, the, lighter, the, the brighter the green, the less used. 
So you can see in this ecosystem, it might cover, you know, 20 something thousand square kilometers in this system, but the hotspots are a much smaller area. They can help you identify where you might want to focus efforts. Um, we can also do things which we talked about, actually Jake has uh, mentioned in the Ecoscope discussion yesterday that we've really found to be powerful is using another analytical approach that shows connectivity in the movement data. So we have this, again, this massive amount of data. Where exactly is the corridors happening? Maybe we draw lines, but we can make the computer identify those. And so this is a computer identified connectivity map. And you can see these pathways are the most important for connecting the ecosystem. So that comes out. So this is aggregate data collected over many individuals, multiple years. We can identify properties of the landscape that we can use to hone in our focus on, right? So that's the landscape of movement in, in my mind, what we call it. Um, we also do individual behavioral identification. I look at this a bit differently than the landscape scale. Now we're really honing in on a single individual, what it's doing. Uh, to understand some of its issues. Uh, this is from Mara Elephant Project, where, they, where Jake has implemented immobility reporting in Earth Ranger, so this is available. Uh, cluster analysis, we heard about it with the winner of the Earth Ranger Conservation Tech Prize. Uh, they're doing something similar. Uh, essentially, with elephants, we can tell if a certain number of hours uh, pass where they stay in the same place, uh, they're likely dead. They don't, stay, they don't sleep that long. Um, and so they sleep maybe three, four hours in one place, sometimes seven on a big day. Once you hit eight hours, they haven't moved. Things are not good for that elephant. So we can use that to identify mortality. Uh, geofencing, people have talked about quite a bit. I think you guys are aware of geofencing, the idea of, of uh, fencing an area, an agricultural boundary in the case of elephants, perhaps, and identifying whenever the elephant walks into it. It can be done real time, uh, help you uh, think about that issue and, and try to engage maybe real time on that issue. Uh, something that we've just been working on, uh, a, a PhD student with MET, Mar Elephant Project, been working on, uh, was using the movement to look at uh, staging of the animal. So the animal is, has a plan for its day, and in this case we were really interested when the animal's planning to go crop raiding. And it turns out the animal doesn't randomly do this. It actually knows it's going to go crop raiding. And so if we look at what the animal's doing from about 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., it can be highly predictive of the fact that it's going to go crop raiding that night. And so what we found is this encamped behavior. So this is, oh, this doesn't work. Anyway, you see those red dots up here. Basically, when the animal is, is really stationary in one place for a long time in the afternoon, it's resting up. It, that's what we call staging behavior. It's resting up, hopefully, or typically in an area with proximity to cornfields or something, and then it's going to go into those cornfields at night. So that tends to be forest fragments in an agricultural landscape. But we also found this other behavior, which we didn't expect to find, uh, called tortuous movements, which is this back and forth meandering. And so in areas where we had a hard boundary in the Serengeti Mara ecosystem, the animal would walk back and forth along the boundary of that hard boundary, slow, slow down its movement, but walk back and forth because there weren't forest patches for it to rest in before it went crop raiding that night. And so with this type of individual behavior, we can start to see into the mind and the preparation the animal is actually doing for a behavior that might be of interest for management. In this case, crop raiding, all of us are interested in, in that behavior. Um, and the animal can indicate it to you, can give you signs of it. Um, so, so this is a map, actually, where the, the, the orange on the map shows you that embeddedness, we call it embeddedness, where they go and sort of hold up and sit all afternoon. And this sort of greenish color shows you the tortuous movement where it's moving back and forth midday. And what we found in the Mara, where there's a lot of forest fragments, they do that embeddedness behavior quite a bit before they crop raid. And we can identify those areas in fact, those areas are used by other elephants, too. So we can start saying, this is, this is where they're prepping to go crop raiding. Maybe we mitigate, do something at those particular locations on the landscape to try to get the whole population, not just that one elephant. Um, but in the, in the Serengeti line, where it's a, it's a harder boundary, they do that tortuous movement. It's less spatially predictable. 
but it's where, where they do that is less predictable, but how they do that is predictable. And so they start moving that back and forth, and it indicates they're going to go crop rating that night. So that's individual behavior giving us a clue into the intention of the animal that can, we can actually use basically a near real time in this case to try to uh, engage that animal uh, and change its mind about what it's going to do that night. Um, ecological properties. Uh, this is general. Migration is the, is the common one people want to know. When is migration starting? What is the trigger for migration? Um, does the animal, is the animal going to migrate? Um, the other thing we find is in different systems, you have different sizes of home range the animals have. And that's a very good indicator of the ecological value of the location. The, if everything's there, everything you need in your life is in one place, in a hotel, you don't need to go far. The bar, the pool, the, the breakfast buffet, whatever is all in one place. You can sit around and relax. Um, if you're having to move very big areas, it tells you about the ecological context that animal's dealing with. So that the way the animal's moving and using the space tells you a lot about the ecological properties in the system. They can help you think about how you want to manage. Um, this is northern Kenya. This is actually what we found in that system is we were looking, we were able to identify the way animals use the landscape differed. In the same ecosystem, it differed uh, between individuals. So elephants are a bit of a pain because they all do different things. In the same place, they all do different things. And so in this case, they did really different things in relation to water. Some of them are really water dependent, always near water. Some of them go quite far from water. And then it was also in relation to humans. Some of them were right with humans, didn't seem to care at all, maybe even at night spending time with hum closer to humans than you might expect, versus others stayed totally away from humans. And those two th drivers really have created different ways they use space in that system, which kind of, in our case, we wanted to know what are the key drivers. It turned out in our system, the key drivers differ by individual elephant, which um, wasn't what we wanted to learn. We wanted to learn what is the one key thing. Anyway, there wasn't one key thing for them. Um, sensors, there's a lot going on with sensors. This is something we've been playing with is actually a, a gunshot detector on a collar um, where you can try to pick up if, if a ballistic was fired, at the, pick up the shockwave from the bullet, actually, not the muzzle blast. Um, and we've done acoustic sensing. I talked to you about the video sensing. Acoustic sensing is another thing where we've done to try to understand a landscape where the animal, again, is collecting the data and moving around, and you're learning about the ecosystem. So I think those are some approaches we use movement for. Um, we're now going to sh shift gears a bit, and we're going to talk about some examples. I, and I'm going to start since I have the mic. And just keep talking to you guys. Um, and, but I wanted to talk about infrastructure development, because this has been a big issue uh, across Africa, massive economic investment, huge infrastructure products go projects going in across the continent. Uh, the lands where they can put in some of this infrastructure uh, tends to be easiest to procure when they're federally owned. The government owns it. It's a lot harder to deal with private holdings. And a lot of these large landscapes that governments owned are protected areas. So there's a big incentive for governments to put infrastructure into protected areas because they own the land and it's easy for them to manage versus trying to deal with every single landholder. So this is coming through these systems that we work in. It's a, it's a reality and what we can do. Um, the, the big story in northern Kenya is the Ethiopian, uh, the Lapset corridor, the Lamu, uh, South Sudan, Ethiopian transit corridor, where the idea is to put uh, big railways, highways, uh, possibly oil pipelines, electrification, et cetera, coming through the middle of these ecosystems that are, have previously been pretty intact pastoralist areas. Um, and so we've done a lot of stuff with movement on this. We have a bunch of movement data across that landscape. We have projections of where the corridor might go. Um, the question is, how can we maintain connectivity with this development? Um, we can take a look at home ranges of these elephants. So 84% of the, of the elephants we've tracked up there, will be, their home range will be bisected by one of these projected courses. Uh, we, can, we can take a look at where they might cross that the most. This is actually a heat map of where elephants are crossing the proposed lapset corridor. The red is the hot spots. And so that can help you identify, well, these 
places we might want to put in some infrastructure to allow, you know, maintain that connectivity. Um, so these kind of things, there's the movement data, the red highlighting uh, where these crossing points are. The crossing points is an example, so the highways there, the, uh, the development, and you can see when you zoom in, you can actually see those crossing points pretty quickly and pretty clearly. So these are the type of things where we're um, trying to do it. Oh, last thing I wanted to just share with you, we had a wild tracks uh, discussion yesterday. This is something we found incredibly powerful for our management and our uh, engagement with elephants is, uh, is our app, uh, a movement-based app on, the, on our phones. We look at constantly, we download the data. It, the data is maintained on our base map so you can move through the landscape when you don't have any connectivity, still know where these animals are. We have navigational features for these um, that allows people to navigate to an animal or attract asset really easily. And this wild tracks is freely available to everybody. So those of you tracking, uh, as you might be visualizing on Earth Ranger, uh, wild tracks is really conducive to field operations of interacting with your, your tracked animal. So if you'd like to discuss that with us, save, all the Save Delphins people where, but we'd love everybody to use this um, and, and share that with us. So I'm gonna hand off, oh, sorry, I had one more thing I was gonna add. <laughs> okay, so there's, um, there's several global initiatives going on on migration. Migration is now everybody's highly concerned. We're gonna lose these migration corridors. And we have the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. And there's a, a global initiative to try to get information about where these migrations are happening. And in this group, a lot of you have uh, tracking data that captures migrations. And I just wanted to encourage you to, uh, they just, they can, you can either email them directly or send a, just send a JPEG, a picture of the, of the tracking data you have. And the idea is to create this global uh, atlas of all the migrations to help everybody become aware of where migrations are, when they're coming under threat, and discuss global solutions to trying to maintain migration. So I'd really encourage all of you to um, try to engage and, and share your information with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, good morning again, everyone. Uh, so we'll switch gears up a bit and uh, talk about uh, giraffes, the tallest land mammal. And so for my talk, we'll just step, up a, uh, step back a bit just to understand what threats giraffes are facing and how we're responding to those threats using movement data. So my name again is Atha Muneza. I, the, I'm the East African coordinator for the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. I oversee our East African program. So just to get a sense of why giraffes are important in this type of uh, case study, is that there are four different species of giraffes that are found across Africa. And many of them are declining, especially if you look at the populations in East Africa. But much of my talk won't focus on the bad news, uh, even though you can see just from the IUCN classifications, like the Nubian giraffe are critically endangered, the reticulated giraffe and the Maasai giraffe are endangered on the IUCN red list. And those are the three key species that occur in Kenya. So for us as GCF, definitely Kenya is a very important country to be in and work with the different partners that work in the region. So again, when you just look at a map, it's easy to forget that these species occur in very different landscapes. Uh, that's the case for giraffe. Uh, they occur in the woodlands, in savannas, all the way to harsh landscapes like, like deserts, where it's very hard to see them you know, with anything else, and all the way to like green, lush vegetations in the mountains or in the forest of you know, Uganda. So giraffes occur very, uh, in very diverse habitats, and that means that they face very, very different challenges. So for the, some of you uh, who may not know, this is a picture from Hell's Gate National Park, not too far from here. But it's just an illustration of one of the biggest threats that giraffes are facing. That's habitat loss and fragmentation. So fences are actually one of the biggest challenges for giraffes. Oh, sorry, we went too far. Uh, fences are one of the biggest challenges for giraffes. Uh, giraffes tend not to see fences very well. And when they get trapped, if there's no immediate response, then you might end up losing that animal. Um, and then the other uh, challenge that giraffes are facing is obviously snaring and poaching. Uh, so we tend to separate those two because some people leave snares in the landscape not targeting giraffe. Giraffe may not be there 
direct target. They might be looking for a small dick dick or all the way to a big animal that they can just uh, carry at home or uh, sell. And then they leave the snares in the landscape. Giraffes get, end up getting trapped. And if the snares are not removed or if the animal is not rescued, the animal ends up dying. Uh, they have no use for the giraffe. Uh, whereas poaching is where they go out looking specifically for giraffe. And giraffe, again, they are special animals. They are hunted for ed everything you can think of. There are places where they only want the tail because it's a sign of power. They want the skin. They want the meat. They want the bones. Any part of a giraffe can be used depending on where you are. Uh, and also one of the biggest challenges that giraffe are facing is actually the lack of long-term and monitoring efforts. Uh, so for us, we work with many different partners across different areas to get a sense of how many giraffe are there and where are they. So it was really good to hear Patrick's talk in the morning, talk about building partnerships just to get a sense of how many animals are there so that we can manage them better. That's really the key question for conservation. Uh, there's also the question of predation. I mean, this is something that occurs. Uh, there are some places where uh, there are lions that have specialized in hunting giraffe. I mean, you might think, yeah, that's a normal thing, it happens, but giraffe are actually quite big animals. So in some parks, it's quite rare to see lions going after giraffe, but in some parks like, like uh, Roha National Park, uh, the lions there have specialized in taking down giraffe. And actually, this ties in with part of what I did for my master's and PhD of looking at disease and that how it impacts movement. So giraffe are mainly affected by different diseases. So this is a picture of lumpy skin disease. It's caused by a virus, so we can respond to it. Uh, but then there are other diseases that are actually quite important for movement. So this is giraffe skin disease. It manifests as lesion on limbs. And obviously that has implication on movement for animals and also how they can respond to predation attempts. So far from the data that we have, uh, mild and moderate forms of the disease do not seem to impact uh, the movement of the animals. But then the equation changes when you look at severe forms of the disease. So to the naked eye, the animals seem to be moving really with no issues. But then we've started now thinking of how can we use technology to better understand these different interactions. So at GCF, we have an initiative, an initiative called Trigger Tracker. So this was a major campaign for us to tag at least 300 uh, giraffe across the whole continent, so not just in one country, because that will be <laughs> too many animals to tag in one country. Uh, but that will be to develop, to use technologies to understand uh, how can we use movement to respond to these different challenges that giraffe are facing. So obviously, tagging a giraffe is easier said than done. I'm sure the vets who are here can attest to that. Uh, and giraffe tagging has evolved over time. So the very first or early forms of giraffe tagging was easy. The easy thing to do when you have a test, just copy your neighbor. We took the elephant tag, put it on a giraffe. So that presented, obviously, some challenges because of the weight and you know, the movement. So we then worked with other partners, Africa Wildlife Tracking. They developed the head harness. Uh, so the head harness was developed for southern giraffe. So again, this brings that question of the four different types of giraffe. So if you go to South Africa, the giraffe there have a smaller median ossicon. So this can potentially work. But for those who've seen the giraffe in uh, uh, East Africa and also Northern Africa, you know that some have a big median ossicon. So this design does not work in East Africa. We've tried, we've tried moving it a bit, doesn't work. Then we worked with Savannah Tracking to develop the OC units. And so that worked reasonably well, fitting it on females, but on males, obviously, there's the question of necking. So that became also another challenge. So now we've worked with Savannah Tracking. I'm sure if you've gone to their tent, you've seen the tail unit. So that's now the latest version that we are using, just fitted on the tail. It fits there nicely, and it's less invasive. And the charging rate and the data transmission rate seem to be similar to the OC unit. And then there is another Australian company called Ceres. They've developed also solar units that go on the ear. They seem to be working really well in Southern Africa, but East Africa, we've tried them in Uganda, but the transmission rate has not been that uh, good compared to other areas. So we've stepped back from using them in East Africa because they don't collect the uh, data to the same extent as, as the Savannah tracking units. So different ways, obviously. So obviously, when we say that we want to tag giraffe, it's not an easy task because of their unique physiology, the long neck, long legs. Uh, and also handling them when they, are, uh, they have drugs in their system. It's a completely different game. So when we want to tag giraffe, it needs to be for a very specific reason and also to, uh, to understand core challenges that giraffe are facing. So what do we mean by that? Uh, so we work with different partners. So this is a photo uh, from Uganda where giraffes were being translocated to Pianupe National uh, Reserve. Uh, it's a park that had been degraded and then the government worked to restore the park and then 
one of the key things that they wanted to do was reintroduce giraffes in the park after 50 years of them being locally extinct. So obviously that means you have to monitor them. So this is just like one of the examples, but you can maximize data to have real management outputs. Uh, so we've shared with, we've worked with different partners to have uh, data that can inform management. So a quick example again, uh, so these are uh, tags that we put on giraffe in uh, Kidepo Valley National Park that is in Northern Uganda. So the park borders South Sudan, and obviously you want to know where are giraffes spending a lot of their time. Are they going north? Before they, you are, they were afraid that if the, park, if the giraffes go north to South Sudan, they, they, then they might not come back. So because we can visualize those data and see where giraffes are spending a lot of their time, we can then know where should the government be prioritizing the uh, survey efforts, how can they uh, uh, make use of their time as well, because these are big landscapes and you need to know where to look. Uh, so obviously, uh, George mentioned looking at things at a landscape level. Uh, so these are some of the prelim preliminary results that we have from uh, survey data in Masai Mara. So we also do uh, photographic surveys, and they can tell you one thing but not the whole story. So the picture that you are seeing, it's a bit convoluted, but what the numbers indicate is simply uh, ident uh, unique giraffes that have been identified moving between different conservancies within the Mara ecosystem. So for those of you who know the Mara ecosystem, yes, you can look at it on the map and you can see, oh, 22 giraffes have moved between Olare Motorogi and maybe Isaten. And you might think, oh, that's a, just an easy route to navigate. But I'm sure if you saw Jared's talk yesterday, you saw the uh, layer that showed the fences in Masai Mara. So it's quite a difficult landscape to navigate if you think of the anth anthropogenic factors. So you can use uh, the photographic uh, data, but it, only t it can only draw a straight line that the giraffe moved between these two points. So that's why if you incorporate uh, movement data, you can get the fine scale data and look at where are the corridors, where do we need to uh, incentivize the communities to either take down the fences or maybe design fences that, might, that might not impede uh, that movement. So this is part of a study that we, we had hoped to do this year, but we've moved to next year to put some colors, uh, to put some tags on giraffes in the Masai Mara ecosystem to just understand where are the corridors in the Masai Mara ecosystem and is the connectivity in the Masai Mara still uh, in a good state for the giraffe to move between the different ecosystems as well as the reserve because that's a key landscape for giraffe if you think of uh, not just the Masai Mara but the country and as well the transboundary movement that happens between Kenya and Tanzania. And so what have we achieved so far through the Twiga Tracker initiative? Well, we've uh, exceeded our expectations. So with, the work, uh, with working with different partners in 14 countries, we've deployed now approximately 330 units. Uh, they've almost 2 million data points collected across the different regions where we've worked. Uh, there are some publications coming up where we are sharing data. And we've also provided logins uh, for the different government partners that we've worked with. Uh, the most recent tagging that we did in Kenya was in Amboseli, and I'm sure if Muteti is here, he has the login for Earthrange as well, where he can visualize the data and make informed decisions from uh, the data that we are collecting. But just to finish up, uh, we are not just interested in tagging, as I mentioned. So as GCF, we do different things uh, to protect giraffes. So this ranges from you know, supporting anti-poaching, uh, providing technical support, capacity building, uh, doing translocations, as I showed in the uh, presentation and also providing support. Uh, WRTI and KWS have been our core partners where we've developed the national strategy for giraffe uh, in Kenya and they are now working on developing the second version that we are doing together. And this is a way where we are in using all the data that is available for giraffe and we are putting them into documents that are owned by the government and then used for management. And that is something that we feel is really good, to, uh, powerful to get uh, different partners involved. And so with that, we've developed partnerships across 18 different countries uh, to uh, support conservation. So with that, I'll end my talk and pass it on to the next elephant person. Brilliant. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Winter, and I'm representing ERA, Elephant Human Relations Aid, an NGO in Namibia. Um, and I'm not going to dive into everything that we do, um, but just give a brief overview of how we're using movement data to mitigate human-elephant conflicts. Um, so we're operating in the northwest of Namibia, which is quite famous for its desert elephants. Um, and so we're um, focusing on the southern part of the northwest, where elephants move outside of national parks 
um, and across a rather complex uh, human landscape. So across conservancy, state-owned land that is not registered as a conservancy, as well as commercial farms. Uh, and each of those commercial farms have sort of a different setup. Um, and the desert adapted elephants have usually stuck all the way to the west. So they use the ephemeral river systems um, and they spend most of the time in a sort of low rainfall zone between 50 and 150 millimeters a year. Um, Namibia goes through quite long drought cycles naturally, has always been, will always do, most likely, between 8 and 15 years um, of drought. Um, and But we are seeing new movements. Um, Maybe that happened way in the past, but for us it definitely is a new occurrence. Um, so elephants have, in the last two years of a long drought, moved all the way to commercial farms. Um, and there people are extremely intolerant. Um, and it, yeah, they, they experience so many losses due to elephants moving through fences. Um, and it's really sort of out of control in that land. So many elephants were shot there illegally. Um, and as we started to like, get to know the area a little bit more, um, the people that we started to communicate with, um, they've been in that area for decades. And they said, you know, it's in the last five years, elephants have been moving in here, not just the desert elephants, but also other free roaming elephants that most likely broke out of Itosha National Park in the north and moved south. Um, so there is a definite shift of home range overall. Um, so what also makes it a little bit more complicated is that the same area falls within three different government zones. Um, so each of those um, regions are being handled and managed individually and there is very little communication between regions. Um, and so movements in general of elephants were not understood at all. And each of the regions and each of the conservancies made their own counts and everything was sort of added up. Um, and overall elephant numbers were and still are overestimated in that area. Um, so that led naturally to elephants being completely mismanaged. Um, and yeah, so many of you might have heard of uh, the rather controversial translocations of Namibian elephants. Um, some herds were taken out of that area due to this uproar of, of yeah, people and human elephant conflict. Um, it really is a conflict. <laughs> it's a big problem um, where no so real solution has been found yet um, because elephants want to be there. There is a reason why elephants shift um, because their core home range starts to become unviable in certain seasons, but also it might be due to climate change too. Um, so everything that um, we are doing with movements is really to mitigate human elephant conflict. Um, and the first and most important um, aspect of it is to prioritize our project and to respond rapidly. So if we see a certain animal um, is moving to um, commercial farms, then we know we're on that animal, um, we're ahead of it, we're, we're present, we're communicating with the stakeholders in the area um, and just sort of, yeah, sort of guard the elephant um, and the people um, equally. So on Earth Ranger, that is basically why we entered into Earth Ranger. It's been an amazing tool so far and we created buffer zones around each village and around each commercial farm as well and we're receiving alerts. Um, we started to see patterns that emerged, so elephants um, using um, homestead water point every night <laughs> and then during the day always hiding away because these are very scared elephants. Um, but there's a very old lady that lives there and is absolutely petrified by elephants but has these elephants there every night for months on end. Um, so we were able to quickly um, so priority is one of our projects, which is providing alternative elephant dams within their um, pattern, movement patterns, um, but away from villages so that the risk of confrontations is lowered. Um, we also started setting up an early warning system for communities and also some selected farmers that um, entered into collaboration with us. Um, we always sign MOUs um, with whoever is receiving the alerts. Um, so whoever is also um, using the same sort of method, um, you, you know how it looks like. Um, so they, the chair people of conservancies are set up 
um, and they are then responsible for sharing that information with their communities. Um, and the response has been absolutely mind-blowing. Um, what it created is a sense of empowerment and ownership um, over the elephants and over the overall coexistence challenge. Um, so in one example, one of the elephants went out of the area and into um, sort of a bit more dangerous zone. <laughs> the conservancy themselves started saying like, hey, you know, maybe you should bring that elephant back because over there it's more dangerous. Like, we can we can keep an eye on these guys. Um, so it, that was quite amazing because we came from a very different background um, where shooting was the only solution to elephant presence. Um, yeah, and then of course we're using movement data for future planning, so... Um, <laughs> didn't want to go on. Oh, here we are, sorry, okay. Yeah, so um, we're trying to obviously provide accurate elephant numbers um, and population movement information um, to any stakeholder, any decision, decision maker um, in the area and um, identifying protecting corridors that seem to emerge. So especially where landscapes are connected, um, it's like this is one male's movement and it's quite um, interesting how he's using a certain channel hugging the mountain um, to navigate between two different areas and the herds start to we see that, that there's a pattern that other elephants use as well and for the future this is important a important place to just protect and perhaps um yeah just keep free for other animals to move as well um then we're also collaborating with the namibia university of course with the government as well um, and look at the overall landscape between our area which is the southern part and the national park um, and all of these commercial farms experience more or less the same problem. So it's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed and um, we're in the very beginning of just understanding what's happening. Um, but um, the idea is to yeah, find sustainable solutions to this um, problem um, and not just a quick fix. So um, yeah, the idea is to open corridors through commercial farms. Um, which is going to be a really long-term <laughs> sort of shot and work with individual farmers, literally on an individual basis, trying to see where do they cross in. And they usually um, use the riverbeds, uh, the dry riverbeds to enter um, the farms. And um, there is, and they always target um, the water points. And they don't seem to be utilizing the whole farm, but really like stricter corners. Um, so there are some farmers that are open to tourism as well because cattle farming starts to become unviable as well in certain areas due to the weather patterns um, so yeah it's a long long process um, but we're hoping to um, yeah achieve a positive outcome for both people and elephants <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. okay so we were gonna we actually had three things we were gonna discuss but we're not we have five minutes um, but I, th I think one of the stories that comes out of this is elephant movement, or sorry, animal movement behavior is a highly sensitive metric of what's going on in the landscape. And if we think about it and you spend some time with it, I think there's, there's many lessons that can be extracted from movement data. So we often focus on the real-time aspect in Earth Ranger, uh, deployment of assets in relation to movements of animals of interest, um, but that data has a lot of value. Um, so we had three topics we were going to discuss in question. Uh, the first of which was going to be how uh, people are using movement in their systems to understand the ecology, the security, and the um, behavior of the animals that they are tracking. So that was our first question. Our second one that actually Kristen just highlighted was using that we've found a lot of success, all three of us have found a lot of success using movement data to communicate with stakeholders, be it uh, government bodies that maybe aren't on the ecological side, say infrastructure development side or land use planning side that don't typically think about wildlife. They, and when you come and speak to these people, sometimes their eyes glaze over, but if you show them movement, it can be, they, people tend to get much more excited. Um, and also down to the very local people where you show them the movement, uh, like Kristen's example, of the, their animals that they're sharing the landscape with, 
It gives them uh, more ownership, more knowledge, and a better relationship because they actually see the animal, what it's doing in a different way. So we found it an incredibly powerful communication tool. And the last one that I'm biased towards um, is I'm really curious to hear how people uh, are using movement and how we can better communicate. I think the Earth Ranger Forum, uh, the Earth Ranger Community Forum possibly could be a, could be a angle for this. But the, I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things across uh, the continent, using movement data, other things as well. And getting information and connections across all of us will help us learn from each other, uh, stimulate new thinking, and hopefully amplify what we're doing. And so I'm very interested in trying to uh, have a better community of exchange to see what everybody's doing across different places with different problems, different ecological contexts. I think this could be a very powerful uh, collaborative tool for all of us to come together and progress uh, our conservation agenda. So I would, and if you guys don't mind, <laughs> I would be biased towards to hear from you guys what you think, uh, how we might communicate and collaborate better across lines for broader, and, and open the forum as well for you guys. But that would be my main interest. And I just wanted to highlight one last thing is Ecoscope, which Jake has, has been developing with MEP, is a mechanism to create standardized reporting from tracking data that we hope will be useful. But we've been trying to understand what outputs do people really need? What outputs from the tracking data are most beneficial in different contexts with different questions, with different conservation challenges? And we don't know. We know what we're dealing with. We know what we think is useful. But we really would value hearing from everybody else uh, what, what we could do and put in a, this forum that, uh, you know, this analytical package that then you can use. And hopefully it would be something you could generate quarterly reports or monthly reports, you know, very quickly. And so that would be our goal. So we'd love to hear back, get feedback, interaction, connection. Um, so I'm going to open the floor to, to things. We have two minutes. <laughs> Does anybody want to add, offer anything? Or questions on anything? We have two minutes. No? Okay, well, that worked out well. Mm -hmm. <laughs>